today we are ranking every arc in Hunter x Hunter. Ranking these arcs is pretty hard because unlike a lot of anime and manga, the quality of Hunter x Hunter is high all the way through. As a result, a lot of this ranking will be personal preference, but I will try to consider literary quality as well. So let's get into it. In 9th, we have the Zoljic Family arc. This is, without a doubt, the weakest arc in the series. It mainly suffers from its super short length, as it means there isn't a ton of time to develop the butlers, and the Zoljic family dynamic doesn't have the depth characteristic of Hunter x Hunter. That being said, the three butlers we do get to see feel well developed and interesting. This moment with Canary is clearly the highlight of the arc, as it shows everyone's devotion to Killua, and reinforces a central pillar of Gon's character. The quick coin game after that is also a fun example of how unique conflict can be in Hunter x Hunter. I don't think it's hard to see why this arc is in last. It's not necessarily bad, the rest are just better. At 8th, we have the Dark Continent Expedition arc. This arc is a bit of a mixed bag for me. It is essentially a setup arc, as it places little pieces of future plot points in our minds to keep us engaged. And to be honest, a lot of what it sets up is really cool. It introduces Beyond, the Five Calamities, and Kakin as a nation. The arc also sets up the rivalry between Jing and Peristin, and reintroduces Krapika and Leorio in a really convenient way. But there are a few things that I think hold this arc back, like that one chapter that is just politics. I understand why it had to happen, as Kakin was about to become a central part of the story, but the way it was just a bunch of people that we don't know arguing over the implications of adding another superpower to the superpower table didn't feel exactly enticing. The other thing holding it back is that a lot of what was laid out in this arc just has not become relevant yet. Obviously this isn't the fault of the arc itself, but if a setup arc's setup hasn't come to fruition yet, it's hard to rate its efficiency. There's really nothing else that I have to say about this arc. It's just a simple setup arc that doesn't really hold a candle to the main meat of Hunter x Hunter. At 7, we have Greed Island. A lot of people like Greed Island, but I personally am not a huge fan. My two biggest issues with it are its isekai-esque nature and Genthru. In general, the concept of isekai has just never interested me. Like, if you're gonna create a fantasy world, just make it and have the characters originate in that world as the main characters. They also feel pretty repetitive, and while the idea of entering a video game wasn't super overdone when Greed Island was developed, it is super overdone now. And I think that does hurt the novelty of the arc overall. As for Genthru, he just feels like a weak villain, especially in the context of Hunter x Hunter. He feels one-dimensional and overly simplistic. His motivations start and end at winning Greed Island, and it feels like he has no reason to be evil other than just being evil. While not every antagonist needs some sort of Griffith-level backstory, when you're in Genthru's position and you're being compared to villains like Krolo and Meruem, having no backstory or complex motivations makes you look kind of mediocre. I think it's less that Genthru is an outright bad villain, and more that the villains that surround him are some of the best in anime. I also think this arc's soundtrack gets a bit repetitive, but that's a super minor complaint. With all that being said, there is a lot that I like about Greed Island. The introduction of Bisky is great, as the series desperately needed some female representation. The development and deepening of Nen was also super cool to see, and watching Gon and Kilo develop their powers was also very cool. This arc also introduced my favorite fan theory from Hunter x Hunter, the Pregnancy Stone Theory. Like all the arcs at the bottom, Greed Island isn't necessarily bad, it's just not as good as the best. Greed Island also has the unfortunate pleasure of being sandwiched between York New and the Chimera Ant arc, which doesn't exactly help its overall image. At 6 we have the Hunter Exam arc. There's something about the Hunter Exam arc that just feels different. After watching so much shonen that feels somewhat the same, the Hunter Exam arc feels like a breath of fresh air in the space. I honestly think it starts from the soundtrack. There's something about it that's so unique and so refreshing. It really helps set the tone for what Hunter Hunter will be and what we should expect for the Hunter exam. In fact, I think part of what makes the Hunter exam so good is that it does something similar with Hunter Hunter as a whole. It does a great job of setting up the expectations for the series while also being super entertaining, which is something that some anime struggle with in their first arc. The arc shows us plenty of unique ways that conflict can exist and be resolved in the Hunter Hunter universe, and it shows us right off the bat that fights will not be the major focus of this manga. I honestly have nothing negative to say about this arc. It's solid from beginning to end, and that's just another way that it exemplifies Hunter x Hunter as a whole. At 5th, we have the Heaven's Arena arc. Heaven's Arena is the arc that made me realize how special Hunter x Hunter is. It was this moment right here. <laughs> 
I'm not sure why, but something just clicked here. The framing, the soundtrack, the surprise. It was the first moment in the series that was truly jaw-dropping to me, and this wasn't even the best moment in the arc, as we do get the Gonen and Hisoka fight a couple of episodes later. This arc is also probably the most impactful one in the show, as it is the arc that introduces Nen. Nen as a power system is amazing, and it plays a central role in everything in Hunter x Hunter from here on out. But right now, I want to focus on how it was introduced to this series, because even that is something to marvel at. Nen is complicated as far as power systems go, but the way new concepts were introduced to us, and the way abilities were used to demonstrate the system was truly masterful. Much like the Hunter exam arc, I have nothing negative to say about this arc. Maybe I guess the minor villains were kind of bad, but even then I think they were surprisingly deep and thoughtful. They represent a specific kind of person that will do anything they can to succeed, except what they actually need to do to succeed, which is work hard. There are plenty of people in our world that will hurt and cheat to get ahead and will never pay for their actions. And I think that's what this trio and their dirty tactics are supposed to represent. But that's a discussion for another day. Overall, Heaven's Arena is a good arc, verging on great if the premise allowed for more complexity. At fourth, we have the Chairman Election Arc. The Chairman Election Arc does something that I don't think I've ever seen another arc do. It was able to create one of the saddest moments in the entirety of Hunter x Hunter with a character that we only knew for 11 episodes. Do you know how hard that is to do? That is a feat of character writing and character depth. The moment between Kilowa and Nanika is a beautifully touching moment, and it does a great job of wrapping up Kilowa's character arc. The reunion between Gon and Leorio is also super emotional, as is that one scene with Bean. I think all of this emotion does a great job creating that feeling of finality that is needed when ending an anime, if that makes sense. The arc doesn't just do endings well though, it also does beginnings. The introduction of Jing and Periston is great. Seeing Alumi as a major villain is great, and seeing Jing and Gon interact for the first time is, of course, great. It's a great arc. It introduces the concept of the Dark Continent as well, and gives a fulfilling end to the anime even though it's not really over. I don't have anything negative to say about this arc, but at this point the competition is getting super stiff, so it just has to be at fourth. In third, we have York New. York New is the first arc that many people consider great in Hunter x Hunter, and justly so. Everything in it is just so good. While there isn't anything groundbreaking in York New, out of every arc, I feel like this one is the highest baseline of quality. It doesn't really go above that quality, but it also never goes below it. The arc also does an amazing job of adjusting the tone of the show, and it really shows us just how dark the world of Hunter x Hunter can get, despite how cheerful the series feels overall. It also introduces us to the Phantom Troop, which is reason enough for a high placing. Its dual perspective narrative between Gon and Kilo's story and Karapika's helps build towards the collision of them and the Phantom Troop, while simultaneously developing the atmosphere of the auction around this conflict. It's also the only arc besides the Hunter exam where all four protagonists are in the same place at one time, and watching them all interact with each other was such a joy. While the arc doesn't have too many fights, it doesn't need to have too many fights, as there are so many other ways that conflict is explored, like the arm wrestling contest and the kidnapping of Krolo. I think this is one of the aspects of Hunter x Hunter that makes it really unique. It's not afraid to stray away from shonen conventions and resolve conflict in unique ways, and York New is the first arc that I think really dives into that. Really the only negative about this arc is that it's so good it makes Greed Island pale in comparison, but that's not really a valid complaint. All in all, York New is undoubtedly one of the best arcs in this series, and it leaves us with only two arcs left on this list. And while it might surprise you, I do believe that number two is the Succession War. I love the Succession War. It might actually be my favorite arc, but I just don't feel right putting an unfinished arc at first. As I'm sure you can tell from the rest of this video, I really value depth of characters and complexity in an arc. And I don't know if there's another arc out there that's as complex as the Succession War, or one that has created so much character depth for such a large cast. It feels like such a unique arc in so many ways. From the isolated environment to the way everything is connected, to the introduction of newer and stranger Nen abilities than ever before. The construction of the actual Succession War is so convoluted but that's part of what makes it so cool. It's a war of politics and espionage, which is something that is rarely seen in anime, and when it is, it rarely has this much depth. The Mafia Wars are also interesting, although I do find them a little bit less engaging to be honest. There's nothing wrong with them, I'm just more invested in Karapika's story than the troops. But the troops' backstory, that was a great three chapters. 
Wars. The Succession War feels like it has an immense amount of potential to be great, and if everything connects well, it will meet that potential. I have faith that once this arc is done, it will be viewed as a feat of multi-perspective storytelling and regarded as one of the best anime arcs of all time. I know putting this arc over York New might ruffle some feathers, but keep in mind that this arc isn't just what happened on the Black Whale, it's also the Krolo and Hisoka fight, and that fight on its own is worth a top 3 placing. So what could possibly top the Succession War? Obviously, the Chimera Ant arc takes the cake. Where do I even begin? While the Chimera Ant arc isn't perfect, it is just about as close as an manga can get. It exists at the pinnacle of the medium, up there with the Golden Age arc, the Return to Shiganshina, and the War arc. And personally, I think it's better than all of them. Well, maybe not the Golden Age arc, but that's a whole other discussion. The main complaint I see with this arc is that the pacing is mediocre or it gets boring. While I understand where this comes from, there are plenty of ways to avoid this feeling. First of all, if you know about the pacing, it feels way better. You can mentally prepare for it and determine the pace that you want to watch at. This really helps smooth out the pacing in just about every way. The other option is to read the manga, as if you get bored or want the story to go faster, you can just turn the pages faster. Now that we've got the most common complaint out of the way, let's talk about why this arc is so good. It's not just the amazing fights, it's not just the amazing characters, and it's not just the palace invasion either. It's the message behind this arc. It's rare that an arc can say the message behind it as blatantly as the Chimera Ant arc did and not be labeled corny. Humans are evil and are worse than the ants we look down on. It is the basis of the message if we strip any depth away. And the way Tagashi dangles this messaging just out of our sight up until the rose is just masterful. It creates a sense of epiphany as the viewer comes to the same conclusion as the narrator at the same time. It's also an extremely powerful message, and one that needs to be repeated on a regular basis, so we as a species do not forget our sins. The arc also has some of the best moments in the series. The entirety of Gon's rage moment was so well done, and once again subverted the norms of shonen rage moments. It carried a somberness and gravity with it that elevated the intensity to a whole new level. The shift into black and white cast a dire emotional tone over the scene, as we think for one second that Killua might have died, only for the reveal that Gon lost his arm. The duo then has one last heart to heart before Gon effectively commits to dying. It's such a beautifully sad moment that acts as the peak of each character's developmental transformation. There's also the Merom Netero fight, which is one of the most hype moments in the entire series and has some of the best narration in the show. It leads to the prayer moment, and brings the aforementioned message into the limelight. And after it's all over, after all the fighting is done, and the majority of the characters have left the palace, we arrive at the final episode, in the ending scene between Meruem and Kamugi. This one scene has made me cry more than any other moment in anime. Hearing the most powerful being in the show call out to a helpless, tiny woman, as he comes to terms with his own mortality is just so humbling. I honestly don't know if I have the words to describe this scene. The way he calls out to her is just shattering, and the moment is complemented by an empty soundtrack and firefly-like lighting, which really drives home the peace and emptiness of the moment, as one of the best villains in Animanga passes away. It is truly a moment that I will never forget. It, along with the other moments I talked about, are enough to push this arc to the top. Even with its detriments, the Chimera Ant arc peaks far secede anything on this list, and that's why it is at number one. And that's the list! If you made it all the way to the end, be sure to subscribe. You obviously like the content, so why not? I'd also like to hear your opinions on all of these arcs in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week for another video.